I swear these NASCAR races are just becoming more and more and more unpredictable. And it's going to stick to my belief that I don't think you're ever seeing someone win 70 plus, 80 plus, 90 plus NASCAR races in modern day. If they start their career today and you put them in for 20 years and you say, can you get the 90 plus wins? I don't think in this era of NASCAR that is ever happening, no matter how great you are, because this crap is way too random. (laughs) <laughs> that's all I know way too random it is too much like this season has been one of the most chaotic NASCAR seasons I can ever remember where every race is to be fair I'm not complaining by the way this is entertaining uh, I think the racing has been actually pretty good and we came into the breakout 400 understanding that the, the actual racing you know like you know clean air dirty gears we knew that was going to be an issue but these races every week are so unpredictable I feel like we've had like four straight lottery races, Pocono, strategy lottery, Chicago street course, lottery, New Hampshire, it rained, lottery, Brickyard 400, lottery. I could feel like there's more. It's just crazy. And yes, the title of the video is Kyle Larson, best in the world. Now you might think that is a shout out to CM Punk. And yes, CM Punk is the best in the world. And you might think that is wrong. Yeah, Larson is not the best in the world. I will admit, don't get mad at me. Please don't click off the video. It is a little bit of clickbait. I don't think he's the best driver in the world. I think he's the best oval driver in the world. But I couldn't put oval in the title because it does not... It doesn't sound as cool as best driver in the world, okay? CM Punk doesn't say best wrestler in the world on his t-shirt. He says best in the world. There's a massive difference. I'm sorry. Please subscribe. Don't unsubscribe. Hit the like button. And I love you. Don't get bad. So the title of the video is accurate. It's just not fully accurate. I didn't give you all the context. Kyle Larson is the best oval driver in the world. I believe so. He's the best oval racer in the world. Dirt. Asphalt go-karts in an oval race. I don't know, put go-karts in Daytona. I don't know if you want to try that. I think he would be the best. One one weakness or two weaknesses I see in him, super speedway racing and uh, road course racing. But in terms of oval racing, just oval racing in all aspects, I know super speedway racing plays a part in that, but I don't think there's anyone better. We will get to that a little bit later on. This was the Brickyard 400. It was an absolutely chaotic race from the start, and we kind of knew that was what was going to happen. Um, With stages, with NASCAR crew chiefs, and just the way NASCAR has evolved in the last, I would say, like five years, uh, even the races where you would expect it to be kind of boring because you can't pass, and, you know, we all expect the Brickyard 400, you know, back, it's first time since, for what, four or five years since we've had the Brickyard 400 back. I can understand why people were not excited for it. I can understand if you didn't like this race, but even like, like I said at the beginning, even the races that I don't expect to be great this entire summer stretch, I was not expecting to really be that great. And I feel like each race has been wildly entertaining. Now this race was not great. This race was entertaining. And I'm not going to complain about that because I like to be entertained. Okay. I'm sorry. It's just how it is. If you are a motorsport fan, you had F1 this morning. If you are an entertainment fan, the Brickyard 400 gave you entertainment, but it also gave you a lot of great strategy. And listen, I know a lot of people don't like stage racing. I get it. I understand it. Um, but the stage racing brings just a completely new level of strategy. It really does. I'm trying to imagine this version of NASCAR without stages. I don't think I would like it. I, I, I honestly think, guys, stage racing, and I've said this for a while, I've never had a complaint about stage racing. I, I'm okay with it. I've had complaints maybe at road courses, like should we bring out the caution? Is that morally correct? Last year, we had road course racing without stage cautions technically, but because the car is so poor at road courses, you saw what it's like if you can't pass and you don't have any stage brakes. Everyone hated the road course racing last year, so NASCAR brought back the cautions because it helps out with the product of entertainment, of restarts, and stuff like that. So I've never had an issue with stage racing, and I think stage racing is what makes this Brickyard 400 like this. It, it causes the the ungodly amount of chaos in terms of pit, pit strategy. The field are doing everything, and, and that invests me into the race because if it's lap 30 of 160, guys, you have to understand, if I'm looking at the front of the field and I know you can't pass, Denny Hamlin towards the end of stage one could not pass 34th place. 34th place was in front of him. Denny Hamlin could not pass him. Literally almost lost the stage to Kyle Larson because Denny Hamlin could not pass 34th place. If that is going to be the situation, okay, 
listen, it's not going to be very fun if there's no strategy. So you got to embrace the strategy. You got to enjoy the strategy. And in my opinion, the Brickyard 400 should be on the schedule, it, plain and simple. I don't care how bad this race is. I, I compute it to Monaco. Monaco in Formula One is god awful. It's been god awful for years. There are, there's probably no way you can make that race entertaining. There really isn't. The track is too small and like, it doesn't make sense. Like you can't race there. Okay. You cannot make passes. You can't race there, but it's Monaco. It's the tradition. It's the luxury. It's the race. Everyone wants to win. So you know what, for one race out of the year, if I have to focus solely on qualifying and I got to make sure I qualify first, make sure I don't make any mistakes and, you know, just get the strategy right and I'll win the race. All right, great. Brickyard 400, if that is NASCAR's one race on the schedule where I know, God almighty, I can't pass for crap, but strategy, you know, and that's what this race showed is that even if you qualify on pole, even if you run up front, strategy, this race is still absolutely unpredictable and in that case, entertaining. It's like its own version of Pocono, but on steroids. Pocono, you can at least pass a little bit, but that is always a strategy race. It has always been a fuel mileage or a strategy race. And I feel like in modern day NASCAR now, the tracks like Michigan, Pocono, uh, the Brickyard, tracks that you would assume do sometimes and a lot of times come under fuel mileage races in the past without stages, it's the same thing. It's fuel mileage races, but it's just played differently. It's it's the strategy is different. You're trying to pit as soon as possible. You're running the race backwards. It's not the same as it was 15 years ago, but in my opinion, it is still very entertaining. So guys, I don't have like that many complaints about this race. You have to understand what you are getting into coming into this race. We knew the next gen car was not going to be good at this racetrack. We knew that no one would be able to pass, but I'm one of them. I was okay with that. I, I'm not complaining about that. I, I get it, but this race is special, and I feel like you want to win the Brickyard 400, and even though you can barely pass, and it takes 10 cars in front of you saving fuel for the best in the world in Kyle Larson to pass them, listen, that's the situation. In the Xfinity Series on Saturday, you had Riley Herbst drive up to the rear bumper of... Uh, was it Cole Custer? And then Eric Amarola was behind. I'm pretty sure it was Cole Custer. I'm sorry that I'm forgetting. But you had exactly what I want NASCAR to be, which is on oval tracks, you're able to, you know, hit your marks, get your left front uh, or your left front fender in a little bit of clean air, try to get underneath or drive up onto your opponent, get to that bumper, try to loosen them up. Riley Herbst did that perfectly. The Xfinity car did that perfectly. And I keep saying this, the Xfinity car is a great car, even with a terrible package where they were only going like 170 into the corners. Some weird weird, not super speedway, low horsepower package, you still had the ability to drive up and like to someone's bumper. That Xfinity car is fantastic in terms of that. This cup car, the next gen car cannot do that. It has its positives at intermediate tracks in terms of side-by-side -side racing. You can race side-by-side -side without getting loose, but the Xfinity car is superior. And so what I want NASCAR to be, go look at the last five laps of the, the Xfinity race at the Brickyard. That's exactly what I want NASCAR to be because you don't have to combat. Like, dirty air is still there, but you, if you have a faster car, if you hit your marks, you can get through it. That is what NASCAR used to be, and I hope one day NASCAR could get back to that. But it's very obvious that with this version of this car, this iteration of this car, that is not possible. There was not a single time someone today that was, you know, was able to really get to the back bumper of someone and make that pass. It required dirty air from someone in front of them. This entire race was about air, 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 just trying to get the run. Even when Kyle Larson was trying to make his way in the last 20 laps of that race, trying to pass guys who were saving fuel, he was purposely just backing off so much on entry just to try and get, instead of two car lengths behind the guy, three, four car lengths behind the guy and get a massive run so he could combat the dirty air and hope the guy in front gets in dirty air, which is what was happening because everyone was saving fuel. And, and that's how Larson was able to get runs down the straightaways and make passes. Um, it's not the type of racing I love to see in NASCAR, but that's, that's what you were getting into with the Brickyards. I'm not, I'm not going to complain about it. The first controversial moment in this race came from Chase Elliott. Chase Elliott, who was uh, running in second, I think, uh, and he comes down pit lane like like normal, like just normal green flag stop. Stage one, usually the strategy hasn't really played out yet until you either get a caution in stage one or the stage one ends and you figure out who stays out and who pits. Well, Chase Elliott goes up to the blend line on the racetrack. He goes over the line, comes back down into the uh, like apron of turn two. And like the normal way you take the the apron in Indianapolis, but NASCAR penalizes him. And that was the first kind of controversial moment where Chase Elliott's upset because apparently 
he talked or had a, had a sheet from NASCAR, like an email or something, and they were allowed to do that. Brad Kozlowski gets penalized for the same thing a little bit later in the race. Same complaint. He's like, wait, I thought we were allowed to do this. This is going to lead into a bigger thing about NASCAR race control, which, you know, it comes full circle. The first incident of this race involves NASCAR race control. The last incident of this race involves NASCAR race control. So we'll get to that in a little bit. I want to go through the race in particular, but that Chase Elliott penalty and then the end of stage one comes and you have people already like Tyler Reddick who decides to run 40 laps in stage one versus Hamlin and Larson who decide to run around, you know, cut it halfway. It's all about, can you take more fuel, you know, less fuel on the pit stop and stuff like that. So the strategy opens up as soon as stage one ends strategy is open. We are off to go and here you go. All right, everything goes crazy. So from that point on, I am invested in the race because everyone is on a different strategy. And then you have cautions and incidents within the race that change it up even more. So that's the very entertaining part about this race. In stage two, the cautions come. William Byron, hard crash. Hard crash down the back straight away. Gladly, he's okay. But this caution, again, switching up the strategy. You're allowed to save fuel under yellow. It's a pretty long caution. So again, this is all changing the strategy. This allows Bubba Wallace to win the stage because, again, strategy. Chase Elliott, who got a penalty, ended up finishing second in the stage. Again, strategy. It gets really chaotic. Uh, you head into the final stage. And now everyone's just trying to be like, okay, how can I pit early and, and get, you know, without going a lap down and run the race backwards? And it's basically turning all these racetracks where you can't pass into semi-road course race strategy. It's kind of weird when you think about it. Martrex Jr. gets involved in a crash where he was trying to go three wide with Ross Chastain and Larson was just like, hey, I'm there. Hey, I'm there. Hey, I'm still there. And yeah, uh, Truex just, I don't really know what he was doing. Uh, yeah, he tried forcing a three wide middle. It didn't work. And then he, uh, Larson's like literally by the curb <laughs> and he just drove into the Larson's right rear and ended up wrecking himself. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to what Truex was doing. I, I don't really understand. Maybe he was just angry at Ross Chastain and then on the following restart another big and this is again you're in the final stage you can't pass obviously so everyone is just going for it guns ho blazing on lap one uh, of a restart and uh, yeah Joey Logano and Jimmy Johnson get involved in this wreck Ryan Blaney who almost won this race was involved in this but luckily he did not really get any damage but his teammate and seven time Jimmy Johnson they are out of this race. Uh, Jimmy hits the wall. Logano hits the wall pretty hard. And to be honest, neither Logano or Jimmy had anything to do with that wreck. They just both got extremely unlucky. I think Jimmy was the one that got right rear hooked and Logano was the one that got left rear hooked. So yeah, that's just very unlucky. Yeah. And looking back at it, the people that were involved in the actual crash, I think it was Hosevar, Blaney, uh, and Austin. D no, Austin Dillon, I don't think is involved in it, but Everyone that actually made the initial contacts got, they, they got through clean. The two guys that got absolutely destroyed were in front of what happened. But, but because Blaney got hooked into Johnson, Johnson gets hooked into Logano. Very unfortunate. Feel really bad for them. The strategy is playing out while this is all going on. Kyle Larson, Chase Elliott, Tyler Reddick, three of the fastest cars all day. They have fuel. They have enough fuel to make it to the end. Denny Hamlin, Ryan Blaney, they're on a different strategy. They just said, all right, you know what? We're going to bank on a few more cautions to help us advance. And that's what they got. The Jimmy Johnson wreck, the Martin Truex Jr. crash in stage three. That helped them in, in order to make it on fuel for their targets. So now we have Reddick, we have Elliott, we have Larson trying to make their way through the field in a track where it's absolutely impossible to pass. And that is where... The best in the world shows up. Larson restarted behind Elliott. He restarted behind Reddick, and he drives his way through the field. The top 10, top 12 cars are all trying to save fuel because they're two to three laps short. Larson's good on fuel. Reddick is good on fuel. They're off to go. And Larson, one by one by one by one, passes each and every one of them and when Denny Hamlin tries to pick up the pace they cannot do it Larson continues to make ground make hay and he's able to basically try to force these guys to run out and it looks like we're gonna have this amazing finish you know five laps to go Brad Kozlowski is leading who pitted on like lap 102 and he's basically running out of fuel or something but he's somehow still running Ryan Blaney apparently one or two laps short and Larson is good on fuel three-way battle for the lead Keselowski makes it all the way to three to go before a caution comes out Mark Jr. left rear tire flat just spins out by himself 
By the way, my bad. It was the Kyle Busch wreck. I forgot about that one. Kyle Busch going underneath Denny Hamlin. That's actually what caused it. Yeah, that, that's the one that caused the overtime uh, and and stopped the race from going in overtime. That, that, that was it. So, yeah, Kyle Busch running top 10, Rex. That's the story of his year. I'm not even going to go into more about that. That's just... That's just unfortunate. He, I mean, listen, I can, I think Kyle Busch has some bad luck, but he's also making some mistakes <laughs> like that. We've seen that for that the past few years from Kyle Busch. He's making some unnecessary mistakes that just it kind of turned a finish. I kind of wanted to see in a chaos. I don't think Kozlowski would have made it because he ran out on the following restart before they even took the green. So I don't remember the exact amount of pace laps, but I think probably Kozlowski would have ran out coming to the white flag probably somewhere around there that's when Keselowski would have run out of fuel so he wasn't going to make it based off the you know just seeing what happened afterwards um but the fact that he was able to carry it that far is insane which does mean that Ryan Blaney was going to make it Blaney was going to make it if that race finished without an overtime finish so the Fords like we've seen they get a lot of uh good fuel mileage their fuel mileage is fantastic and this is the moment of the race because Keselowski runs out of fuel coming to the green he pulls off in a pit lane that allows Larson who's restarting third to jump up into the front row and that basically that means he's winning this race because the outside lane was never going to work Blaney gets pissed off because just it's very unlucky for Ryan Blaney it's it, let's just face it if Keselowski runs out of fuel before the choose cone then Blaney can pick the bottom lane but because he ran out of fuel coming to the green, there's no way Blaney can obviously switch. Like, that's not allowed. So you just move someone up on the in the, the row. Very lucky for Larson. Very unlucky for Keselowski and, and for Blaney. Well, not unlucky for Keselowski. They just ran him out of fuel. But unlucky for Ryan Blaney. And then this causes another crash. Overtime comes out. They wreck heading into turn one right away. Boom. Kumbaya. Crash. And so that's basically that. We kind of know that, you know, this race is basically over. Larson's going to win. It's just about what is going to happen after that. And so the race ends in a very odd way. Larson obviously coming to the to the white flag lap. He's clear. He's on his way. Uh, Ryan Blaney put up as big of a fight as he could, but, you know, wasn't able to hold off. Larson, Reddick is in the second. Ryan Priest, um ends up crashing down the, like, coming off turn two. He's, he ends up crashing. And he hits the inside wall. Not hard, but he hits the inside wall. And this is why I mean by we're, we're bringing this back to race control. I apologize, this is going to be a long video. We're bringing this back to race control. So he spins out, he hits the inside wall. Because it's a single car wreck, NASCAR decides not to throw the yellow. And I tweeted a little bit earlier, this is something that's annoying me about race control, is that race control, instead of consistency with cautions, if Ryan Priest crashes exactly like that with 30 to go, it's a caution. But because they are in overtime, they don't want to throw the yellow. Okay, so now this is acceptable that we can change the rules of the cautions and when they should come out based off the situation of the race. I don't agree with that, but okay. The teams and the drivers need to understand for strategy purposes that if this happens, it will be a caution. Like people, like teams literally based a strategy off more cautions coming out. So if you are changing the way that cautions are called, it that you're manipulating the race. You, as NASCAR race control, you are manipulating the race to however you see it. And you could also say it's like a ball and strike call or whatever. A caution means there is an accident on the track and it's really for safety purposes. Okay, that's what it's supposed to be, but we move on. All right, so Priest is wrecked. And Kyle Larson's going down the back straightaway in a turn three, coming out of turn four. And you can clearly see they have a camera on him. Priest is not going to get back going. He has a flat, he has, because the next gen car, you can't move with flat tires. Another fault with this car. You, he, he's, he's stuck. He's stuck on the, on the racetrack in the infield of turn two. And NASCAR has a solid 10 seconds to throw the caution. They don't. Larson comes across the start finish line. He heads into turn one. Still no caution. Coming out of turn one, they throw the yellow race is over this is my thing about race control you cannot be doing this i understand like in another way i understand you don't want to restart the race for a third time because people are running out of fuel that's not your job your job is to call the race accordingly not based off what helps or what if you want to just get out of there or or people are running out of fuel if someone wrecks and hits the inside wall and can't get going and you have 15 seconds to call the yellow, call it. Okay, we have to do another overtime. That's fine. 
That's fine. That If that is how the race goes, that's how it goes. You are changing the rules. And, and so now, if I am a crew chief, and I know, all right, if this happens in overtime, NASCAR might not call it. I have to put that into my strategy. If Ryan Priest hits the outside wall, if he spins out and hits the outside wall, it's a caution. But because he spun out and hit the inside wall, it's not a caution until he stops on the racetrack. Like I said, you guys might disagree with me on this, but I don't like the changing of what is a caution based off the situation of the race. That I don't like. Because sometimes NASCAR, I remember at Nashville, a car, I don't remember the exact car who it was, but a car brushed the wall. I mean, brushed the wall. And they threw that yellow so fast, I didn't even know it was possible. The, the constant race manipulation of NASCAR and the cautions, where it directly affects strategy and is affecting outcomes of these races, is really pissing me off. Because there's absolutely no consistency on it. At any point of the race, I don't know what a yellow is. I really don't. Especially come towards the end of the race, I don't know what a yellow is. If there's a single car wreck and it's to the outside, it's it's a yellow. If it's to the infield, it's not a yellow. If there's two cars that go to the infield, is that a yellow? Is that not a yellow? I, I don't know. I don't I don't know what a caution is anymore. Frustrating. It's just really frustrating. And from the beginning of the race, with not making it clear to what the rules are for Keselowski and for Elliott and for everyone in the field, basically, the rules are not clear, to now, at the end of the race, the cautions... Again, all year, don't know what a caution is. It's too inconsistent. I'm just tired all season of just the inconsistency. I don't know what the hell is going on in race control. I, it's just, I don't, I don't, I don't like it. That's just my opinion. I, I, this video is going on way too long. I don't like it. All right, let's go to the race results because it's been going on way too long. Larson, Reddick, Blaney, Bell, Wallace, Gillen, Cindric, Suarez, Graxon, and Elliott round out the top 10 at the Brickyard 400. Larson is now only one crown jewel away from the Grand Slam of crown jewels. He needs to win the Daytona 500, which to be honest, I don't have much faith <laughs> in Larson winning the Daytona 500. I have not seen Larson really compete at a super speedway legitimately. I don't know if he's going to do that, but he is one away and the 500 is so random. You know what? Maybe one day he can. He usually is running, you know, sometimes he is running up towards the front towards the 500, but then he crashes like diabolically. In the end, this race was chaotic. Uh, and while I am complaining about race control, I'm not really complaining about the race. I'm just complaining about the way NASCAR is officiating things. That's just my opinion, but I'm not complaining about the race. I thought for a Brickyard 400 guys, this was as good as it gets, like, you come in with low expectations, just like if I was watching Monaco. You come in with low expectations. You hope to be pleased. I was pleased. I was entertained. I was able to see one of the best drivers in the world in a car that you literally cannot pass in go from 20th up to third place. Like, that was extremely, extremely, extremely impressive. Just for context, Chase Elliott, who restarted in front of him, he was like 17th by the end of that, that same run. He literally didn't move. And he's a teammate in a Hendrick car. He was just as fast as Larson today, and he couldn't move. Larson was able to, to really get up there along with Tyler Reddick, who was following him through uh, while people were saving fuel. So, um, yeah, fantastic. He, he is the best in the world. Larson is the best in the world, oval, oval in the world. Uh, fantastic for him. Congratulations to him. I will see you guys not next week for a race review because next week there is no race, uh, which... To be honest, it's kind of nice. I, I feel bad for NASCAR teams and people who work in NASCAR because there literally are no off weeks for like nine months, which is crazy. This is the one off week they have. I kind of think they should have another one. <laughs> like it used to be two or maybe even three. I, it used to be two off weeks in a season, but now it's I think it's only one and it, it's kind of crazy. So next next weekend, there is no NASCAR race. Enjoy. I will see you guys tomorrow for another video. Take care of yourselves. I'm sorry this video is way too long. Hopefully you guys hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe. Leave your comments down below what you think. Am I being too harsh on NASCAR race control? What do you think about the other incidents in the race and everything around the Brickyard 400? Um, also with NBC, you know, leaving the race with two to go. That, that happened. Now, obviously, there are special circumstances. You know, something in the political world happened today that, you know, NBC needs to cover it at their nightly news at six. I understand it. If the race was going to end on time, it would have never been a problem. But um, yeah, what do you guys think about that? I have NBC and I have Peacock and I have USA, so I just don't care. I just switch the channel. But I know for people that, you know, don't have that or they're streaming it somewhere or it's just an inconvenience, I understand. So 
yeah, what do you think about that whole situation? Um, take care of yourselves. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Peace out.